Part 1. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions 1 to 8, choose the best answer, A, B or C. 1. You overhear this conversation between a doctor and her patient, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones wants the doctor to A. Give him some medicine. B. Send him to hospital. C. Examine him. Now then, Mr. Jones, what seems to be the matter with you? Well, I've been suffering from extremely bad stomach pains. I've hardly dared leave the house. Hmm. Are you experiencing any sickness? Of course I'm experiencing sickness. That's why I'm here. No, no, Mr. Jones, you misunderstand me. Well, anyway, it's probably just a bug you've picked up. Nothing to worry about. I'll give you some drugs to ease the symptoms, and I suggest you go home and get plenty of bed rest. If you don't show any improvement in a day or two, come and see me again. What? Aren't you going to check me over? That won't be necessary. But what if I'm seriously ill? I might need hospitalisation. I might be dying. Now, now, Mr Jones, let's not be melodramatic. I'm sure there's nothing seriously wrong with you. I could sue you for medical negligence. I demand a second opinion. You can be sure I won't be coming to this surgery again. Good day. Mr Jones, come back. You want your prescription. Two, you'll hear a dentist's receptionist talking to a patient, Mr. Brownlow, on the phone. The receptionist offers Mr. Brownlow A. Just an appointment for a thorough inspection. B. About six appointments. C. The chance to have all his treatment at once. What's that, Mr. Brownlow? Uh, can you speak a bit more clearly? I can hardly make out what you're saying. You want to make an appointment to see Mr. Pullum... Your teeth are in a bad way, you say. How long is it since your last inspection? What's that? Three years. Oh, well, Mr. Brownlow, I must say I'm not surprised your teeth need attention. You haven't had them checked for three years. Mr. Brownlow, I can't tell you enough how important it is for us all to have our teeth checked regularly. If problems aren't spotted early on, it can lead to decay, which means fillings and even extractions, you know. I expect you'll be needing a lot of fillings. I tell you what, I'll put you down for a thorough inspection, but I'll leave room in the appointment book so that you can stay in the chair and Mr. Pullum can do any fillings and other work, like extractions, that might be necessary. How does that sound? Bearing in mind that after this length of time you've as good as stored up half a dozen spells in the chair. What's that, Mr. Brunner? Oh, I see. You've decided you don't want an appointment at all. He's rung off. I wonder what I said to upset him. Three. You will hear a woman and a man discussing Charlie, who has injured his leg. Charlie is A. A cat. B. A dog. C. A child. Will my little Charlie be all right, Doctor? Well, I've examined him thoroughly, and I'm pleased to say that Charlie is going to make a full recovery. I've given him an injection and cleaned the injury up a bit. Just make sure he keeps off that bad leg until it's well. And keep him out of fights from now on. Oh, dear. I do hope he'll be able to manage all right. <laughs> it will be terrible watching him hobbling around the house. I do worry about him so. He's such a naughty little boy. <laughs> you really shouldn't worry yourself. He'll only be out of action for a short while. I'm sure he'll be up and chasing rabbits again in no time. Won't you, Nasha? Sorry, what's his name? Growler? Oh, no, 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 this one's Charlie. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking such good care of him. I'd better be off now. I want to buy some steak for Charlie's tea before the butcher shuts. You're welcome. So, that's what you've been feeding him on, is it? Steak. I wondered what was making his coat so thick and glossy. Yes. <laughs> oh, look, he's getting up. He must be feeling better already. <laughs> oh, you little darling. <laughs> Come along with Mummy, then. And this time, don't bark when you get on the bus, you naughty boy. <laughs> Four. You'll hear someone introducing some performers called the Bouncing Beans. The Bouncing Beans are... A. Magicians. B. Dancers. C. Acrobats. 
For our next quite magical performance, I would like to introduce a group of incredible young men who are causing a stir throughout England with their amazing, if somewhat unusual, Terpsichorean talents. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to put your hands, or if you prefer, your feet together for the toe-tapping, madly moving, proudly pirouetting, jazzily jumping, fancy footwork of the Bouncing Beans. <laughs> Five, you will hear an angry market trader speaking to his supplier on the telephone. The trader refuses A, an apology, B, a refund, C, a fresh delivery. Hello, is that Ferdinand's Fresh Farm Foods? It's about a delivery I received this morning. I have a complaint. What do you mean, what's the matter with it? It's rotten. That's what the matter is. Call yourselves Ferdinand's Fresh Farm Foods, indeed. I'm sorry. Fine words and apologies are all very well, but I need some stock to sell at the market. What? Yes, I know I can have my money back, but that won't keep my customers happy. I've got a stall. It opens at ten and I've nothing to sell. No, I tell a lie. I've got a ton of mouldy potatoes, a ton of slimy carrots and two tons of squashed tomatoes to sell, thanks to Ferdinand's Foods. Not to mention the eggs and the fruit. What? Straight away? Without further charge? Oh, well, thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Six. You'll hear two people discussing a minor road accident. According to these people, which vehicle was stationary when the accident happened? A. The bus or the lorry. B. The van. C. One of the cars. Gosh, there's a lot of damage here. Yes, the man in the green car came out of that side street without indicating and ran straight into that red car that was just turning in. It was all his fault. Oh, I'm not so sure. I think the red car was going too fast. Otherwise, it would have stopped in time. Anyway, how did the school bus and the lorry get mixed up in this? The bus was coming up behind the red car, and it had to brake suddenly to avoid it. So it spun out into the path of the lorry. Uh, I didn't see the actual smash because of that van that's parked there in the way. I don't think anyone's hurt, though. Thank goodness. Oh, here come the police. Look, the children are fine. They're enjoying the adventure. Of course they are. Thanks to this, they'll be having the day off school. Seven. You'll hear this announcement on a chat show. Mr. Cook is famous as A. A singer B. A violinist C. A fashion designer My next guest possesses a voice which has been described as an innovation and also superbly original by classical buffs and pop enthusiasts alike. His unconventional rendering of the theme from Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto, whilst technically brilliant, also brought a new meaning to the concept of vocal art. He has made a speciality of turning the old to the new and making it accessible to all. This fact being reflected by the great success of his catgut rag, which is currently at number one in both the British and American charts. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Nigel Cook. Eight. You'll hear a couple, a woman called Alice and a man called Peter, who are going to a wedding reception together. Alice suggests that if they buy some clothes beforehand, they can A. Put them in their car. B. Take them to the reception in smart bags. C. Wear them at the reception. The wedding's at two and the reception's at seven, so there'll be a long gap between the two. Yes. We could be stuck in a strange town for four hours. Well, I wouldn't say stuck. It's a lovely town. We could do some shopping. We can't turn up at the reception carrying bags, though, Alice. And we don't want to go trailing round the shops in our best clothes. You're being awkward. We can put our shopping in our car. As for our clothes, we could even buy new ones if it came to that and go to the reception inside our shopping. Well, I'm not too keen. It could be a very expensive way of filling in time. Part two. You will hear a woman called Jean telling you about her journeys to Birmingham. 
For questions 9 to 18, complete the notes which summarize what she says. You will need to write a word or a short phrase in each box. Hello, I'm Jean. I'd like you to meet my friend George. Come to that, I'd like to meet him myself. The trouble is that he lives in Birmingham, nearly a hundred miles from here. He used to live in Windsor, just down the road from me, but he got a place to do theater studies at Birmingham University, and off he went on his motorbike. So, here I am at the travel agents. I'm visiting George. But should I go by coach or train? I've studied these leaflets, but I'm finding it very hard indeed to make up my mind. One thing's for sure, I won't be going by motorbike. I don't know how George can bear all the fumes and noise on the road. Last time I visited George, I found the coach very comfortable. It wasn't very convenient, though, making my way to Victoria Coach Station before I could really start my journey. It took me an hour and a half to get to Victoria. First, I had to get the train from Windsor to London. Then, I had to take the tube to Victoria. And guess what? I chose the wrong platform and went the wrong way, heading back out in the Windsor direction. As a matter of fact, it took me as long to reach Victoria as it did to get from Victoria to Birmingham. <laughs> George was waiting at Birmingham for the coach to arrive. I'd expected to be an hour earlier, but I'd missed that coach. He was really fed up by the time I finally made it. Part of the trouble was that I wasn't able to let him know about my mistake on the Underground Railway. I could have phoned from Victoria, but that would have meant missing another coach and being two hours late instead of one. I wish they'd install phones on coaches. That's one way in which the train is better. You can keep in touch. There's not much catering on coaches either. When I got to Birmingham, I was famished. George had to take me straight home and feed me. <sighs> Whichever way I travel this time, I'll take care of that before I set off. I know it costs a lot in London, but it costs all the more once you're on the move. Part 3. You will hear five different people talking about their experiences on holiday. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to F what happened to each one. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. And then it stopped. We seemed to be standing there for ages. Then at last the guard came through. Not in person. I mean, he came through on the intercom. He said they were attending to the engine. Something silly like a fuse, I think he said it was. Of course, we were all concerned about our connections. But what could we do? Just sit there and fume. It was one of those times when it definitely isn't quicker by rail. The first I knew there was something wrong was when the hydrofoil cut out. Of course, we came to a standstill almost at once, but when I say standstill, I simply mean that we stopped going forwards. The up and down movement became much more pronounced, and I really disliked it. So did my stomach. Anyway, a tug came out and fetched us, took us into port. And not before time. I don't think I'll travel like that again. It was smashing. From the upper deck, I had a wonderful view of the scenery. By train, you seem to spend half your time in tunnels and cuttings. Well, this was different. I could see over all the hedges, and every twist and turn of the road gave a different view. The driver gave us a commentary on the main geological features, and I feel I've learned a very great deal in the course of my tour. I really liked the wind in my hair. It was one of the biggest treats of my childhood, whizzing along in my uncle's sports car. Well, this was as good, except, of course, that I had to supply the necessary leg power. The speed was less and the uphill stretches were very exhausting, but somehow I found it even more exhilarating than the motorised excursions I used to have with my Uncle Bill. So I've parked at the top of the cliffs? and I'm enjoying the view. Who cares about a slight delay when the weather and the view are so stupendous? I knew there was something wrong because of the squeaking noise whenever I let in the clutch. I rang the motoring organization and told them I'd try to get to Winterton Ness, which I've managed to do. 
Now it's a case of relaxing and letting someone else come and sort it out. I suppose I'll have to stir myself when the mechanic turns up. But till then, I haven't a care in the world. Part four. You'll hear a conversation in a shop between a customer, an assistant, and the manager. Answer questions 24 to 30 by writing C for customer, A for assistant, or M for manager in the boxes provided. I'm afraid I have a complaint to make. Oh, dear, what's the trouble? It's this compact disc you sold me. Doesn't it work? Oh, yes, it works, but it's the wrong music. You've bought the wrong one? Well, yes and no. The label says Rachmaninoff, and the disc itself says Rachmaninoff. But when I play it, the music's Tchaikovsky. Are you sure? Oh, yes, I can't be wrong about that. So I went through the motions of buying the right disc, and I finished up with music I can't stand. Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture. What a racket. I'll just go and fetch the manager for you. Hello, madam. Can I help you at all? Oh, hasn't the assistant explained the problem? No, and she's just going off for her lunch break. Mm, I thought she was a bit eager to get away. It's this disc I bought here on Saturday. It says Rachmaninoff, but it's actually got Tchaikovsky on it. Hmm, I wonder how we can check it. I'm a bit irritated because head office hasn't provided us with a CD player in the shop. Well, I can definitely assure you that I'm right. I know all the music, and there's no way there's any piano on this. Well, the trouble is that I can't test any replacement we give you. You might go over the same thing again. It, ah, hello, Mary. That was a quick lunch break. I thought I'd just better tell you that there's ice all over the pavement outside. That's impossible. It's the middle of summer. I think it's from the butcher's shop next door. He's defrosting his freezer or something. Well, that's most annoying. It isn't the first time it's happened either. I'd better go and speak to him as soon as I've dealt with his customer. Would you like me to go? I know he's a bit surly, but he doesn't scare me. That's courageous of you. Oh, well, you can call in on your way to lunch. I'm sorry, madam, we seem to be taking a lot of your time. Well, the best thing we can do is to give you your money back. Then you won't risk getting the same thing again. <laughs>